Hello, everybody. And thank you for joining us this evening for the first panel of the IEF virtual conference, which is titled Health Equity and Climate Change. My name is Anisha, and I will be the moderator for today's session. Um, before we get started, um, I just have a few things to go over so that our session will be smooth sailing. If everybody could keep their mic muted, that would be great. Um, we also have the chat function um, activated. So as our panelists are giving their presentations, please feel free to share any reactions or comments that you may have. Um, if you do have any questions, I'll ask you to keep them all the way until our panelists have finished speaking. That way it'll be easier for, for us to pull up your questions and um, share them with the panelists. Uh, finally, this panel is being live streamed and it will also be recorded and it will be available shortly after the end of the conference if you'd like to see it sometime in the future. So to get started, we know that climate change is a real threat to our planet and our way of life. Scientists and UN officials have warned that if governments don't take drastic action to reduce carbon emissions immediately, much of the world will suffer climate catastrophes, such as devastating sea level rises, longer and more intense heat waves, and widespread species loss, among other consequences. But what is the effect of climate health on our, on our health? While climate change is a global phenomenon, it is people and communities at the local level that experience its consequences. The relationship between climate change, health, and equity are so closely intertwined that we cannot talk about one without addressing the other. For example, the energy that we use, transportation, housing, how land is used for agriculture and industry, as well as many of the socioeconomic systems are all key contributors to climate change, but they are also the key shapers of the community living conditions and health outcomes. And while climate change affects everybody, its impact is not equal or fairly distributed across people and communities or even nations. It is clear that our approach to mitigating climate change is not good enough and our actions do not meet the urgency of the current needs. In looking to find solutions, we must also address some of the concerns that may arise, such as whether our institutions and systems are prepared to, and capable of implementing the changes needed to promote social and health equity while at the same time keeping climate change and environmental sustainability at the forefront. In the Paris Agreement, heads of state and representatives of countries came together to establish goals that would reduce carbon emissions. But the agenda set for, the, for COP26 shows that these goals were not met and that we have to come back to the table with more ambitious goals to achieve the necessary benchmark to avoid the point of no return. Would we be more successful in achieving these goals if we looked at, uh, if we pivoted our perspective to justice, ethics, and human, um, human priority? Also more recently, in light of the pandemic, we have seen the rise in the importance of mental health, but have we considered the long-term and generational impact climate change is having on the psychology and mental health of our population? And so on this note, I am so thrilled to introduce our three panelists this evening, Dr. Mojgan Sami, Dr. Farhang Tazib, and Dr. T Jill Turner. And I am hoping that they will share their insights and perspectives on these important aspects of climate change, and that they will help us to think about these concerns as we move forward. Without further ado, I will pass the bat baton on to Dr. Mojgan Sami. Thank you so much, Anisha, and uh, to IEF and the Adora Foundation for inviting me and to my fellow panelists and all of you in advance for the discussions ahead. You know, these pandemic times have made me very reflective as an interdisciplinary scholar who studies the nexus of public health, climate change, urban planning, and social justice. I think it's quite important to highlight at the outset that the COVID-19 pandemic did not create new injustices and inequities. It exacerbated and laid bare the historic injustices and inequities that have existed for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. 
not just inequities in health outcomes as a result of global resource disparities, for example, our inequitable vaccine distribution around the world, but also inequities in our social, environmental, and institutional structures, governance structures. I would also like to point out that the concept of public or population health is not synonymous with medicine. We are sisters in the process of health. Public health aims to prevent disease and injury in a population. The public health model is one of prevention, the prevention of harm and disaster before it arrives at our doorstep. If we do our job right, in fact, if we did our job right in public health, our medical systems would not have been overwhelmed with COVID-19. Medicine aims to treat individuals to ensure they do not die because of injury or disease. COVID-19 has really become a real time case study for the importance of understanding a public health approach, the prevention of harm, and the lessons learned about the dangers of a weak public health system. Particularly for our brothers and sisters in medicine and emergency services. WHO recently reported that over 155,000 healthcare professionals were lost since March of 2020, when the pandemic was just starting to rage across the planet. The recent extreme heat waves in the Pacific Northwest in the United States and Southwestern Canada called heat domes this summer of 2021 caused by climate change were reported to be one of the deadliest catastrophes for our health workers and EMT workers since COVID-19. In fact, there were reports of EMT workers burning their knees as they knelt on sidewalks to help people who had passed away or who were in distress because of heat stroke. What does climate change have to do with public health and medicine? Everything. Who do we imagine we will look to to save us from extreme weather events? The breakdown of our outdated electric grid, inadequate infrastructure, destroyed infrastructure, further heat waves. As public health works to prevent disease and injury at the population level, we address what are called the root causes of disease and injury, which lie outside of doctor's clinics and hospitals. They go beyond individual behaviors of healthy choices. The root causes of harm, injury, and disease lie in the structures of our society, which include, but are not limited to, land use, housing stock, healthy soil for healthy agriculture, potable water, systems of trade, infrastructure development, social and economic development, income equality, gender equality. In fact, the sustainable development goals provide the foundation for population health and well-being. In my research, I actually define health equity through the lens of the root cause of disease and foundations for public health and well-being. Without gender equality, for example, we cannot achieve our highest possible level of population health. Without a healthy planet that provides us with equitable access to potable water, soil to grow food and air to breathe, we don't have a healthy society. Without deliberate, urgent action to protect our ecological environment, we will see many more spillover diseases from animal to human species in what WHO has called the age of pandemics. We can't rely on our doctors and nurses and EMT workers, emergency workers, to save us from ourselves when disasters hit. We have to prevent those disasters in the, in the first place for the highest possible level of health equity. The Lancet publishes a climate change and health report annually, and this year they highlighted the red alert for humanity as we enter an extremely critical stage of climate change during a pandemic, which demands urgent action. I'm also reminded at this time of a 2015 Lancet report that said one of the greatest challenges of our time is not technical. It's not policy related, it's conceptual. It's the lack of imagination about ourselves and the way that we manage our world and prevent harm. 
In fact, I've often contemplated how fast our imagination and creativity works for technological advance and entrepreneurship to make profit, but how slow we are to reimagine our world, to stop dragging the carcasses of past conceptualizations behind us, as Anundati Roy so aptly stated in her essay titled, The Pandemic as a Portal. Perhaps for the first time in our history, humanity is at the precipice of a new system of global governance, one that reimagines our relationship with the land, with water, forests, animals, and each other, towards the recognition of our interdependence as one human species and our connection to the one planet that we share as a home with complex life forms that simultaneously exist with us. Just as the bubonic plague, the Black Death being one of the last and most deadly waves of the plague, ended the feudal system and ushered in the nation state system in the 14th century, we may be witnessing the futility of a socially constructed system that divided our planet into arbitrary nation states and drove violent competition for exclusive rights to the earth's resources, for political and economic power and financial gain over ecological and human well-being. Even the COVID-19 pandemic could be said to have its origins in our outdated and destructive governance structures as we displaced millions of indigenous communities from their ancestral lands, decreased the natural barriers between wildlife and human settlements, and destroyed natural habitats for destructive agribusiness practices and resource extraction. Animal viruses such as SARS-CoV-2 had an easier time jumping from animal to human species. WHO calls climate change one of the greatest threats to human health in the 21st century. I call the lack of imagination about our relationships in the world a greater threat. Our existing systems and relationships do not equip us to address the health impacts of climate change, let alone deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. The needs and exigencies of this day and age outpace our current systems, both conceptual and tangible. In fact, climate change and pandemics are closely intertwined. For example, increased levels of air pollution is directly correlated with higher morbidity and mortality rates for COVID-19. We cannot separate human health from the direct and indirect impacts of climate change. Do we really imagine that our current systems, structures, relationships, and conceptualizations of the world will help us survive the next pandemic, the next extreme heat event, the increasing air pollution levels across the planet, the warming of our oceans? Can we guarantee equitable outcomes? As we Are we prepared to save the millions of people whose homes will be uninhabitable because of sea level rise, chronic droughts, the destruction of soil, wildfires, and repeated heat waves because of our insatiable desire for resources and short-term financial gain. The fact that climate change is caused by human behavior is not disputed by scientists who study the climate. What is debated often is the severity and timing of the end and the predictions of the point of no return, which close consensus says we're getting close to. As public health scholars, we thought it was enough to help the public understand the science of health and vaccines in order to end the pandemic. I think we all assumed that the global community would join together in unity and solidarity to get us out of the pandemic. Dr. Tedros of WHO constantly calls on us to accept both science and solidarity in our path. Yet here we are, still suffering from high rates of transmission and death inequitably even though we have the scientific tools to end the pandemic. What are we missing? I think it's a lack of imagination to create new institutions, structures, relationships, practices, policies that are based on the interdependence of our lives with each other and our planet. We are missing a planetary perspective in this day and age where our problems, even our diseases 
are global in nature. COVID-19 does not respect borders and boundaries, neither does climate change. We cannot postpone action until 2030, 2050 to mitigate greenhouse gases and adapt our infrastructure for health equity and climate justice. Can we really address planetary problems with outdated systems of national sovereignty and markets? We're not going to buy our way out of the pandemic or climate change. A planetary perspective is needed to address the root causes of disease and injury in the Anthropocene. A planetary perspective is needed to address global warming and climate change. Our imaginations have to move beyond borders and competition for resources or this trade-off between current and future generations. Our imaginations must include moral and ethical frameworks that envision a world that embraces its planetary reality. We are one world, one human species. We have a diversity of cultures, languages, and ideas. We need to harness that diversity into our collective imagination if we really want to save this planet and ourselves. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Sani. What an interesting and uh, call to action to expand our creativity. Um, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Tazib. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, um, I'm going to reiterate some of the themes which actually, uh, uh, which 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 uh, she has actually highlighted. It's a great pleasure. Thank you to be part of the annual conference, International Environment Forum, particularly at this time on the first day of the COP gathering, where leaders have have spoken of minute to midnight, we're digging our own graves, and very other dramatic sentences which, which they have used on this first day. There was a sense of excitement, anticipation, and certainty, uh, waiting to see what the leaders decide in the next couple of weeks. It feels as though it's about all of us, and it's really important, and what happens next will impact on all of us. The hundreds and thousands of initiatives, events, vigils, geeky scientific presentations, passionate presentations, demonstrations. And I'd like to thank IEF for, for being part of this huge global conversation around climate change. The health community around the world has come together and written a letter to all the heads of state and national delegations attending the head at the COP highlighting the harms to health climate and calling for urgent climate action. This particular letter, which is called the Healthy Climate Prescription, notes that as health professionals and health workers, we recognize our ethical obligations to speak out about this rapidly growing crisis that could be far more catastrophic and enduring than that of COVID-19. Therefore, in the couple of minutes which I have, I just want to share, explore and reflect on the nature of these ethical obligations referred to and their implications for policy and practice. And as a public health physician, like uh, Dr. Sami, I want to reflect on options for prevention and addressing these systemic issues. The Healthy Climate Prescription has actually been signed by more than 300 organizations representing more than 45 million nurses, doctors, and health professionals worldwide. That's about three quarters of the global health workforce. The question is whether the patient will take the prescription and whether the medicines will actually work as, as highlighted. The letter was creatively taken from the WHO headquarters in Geneva to London by, by a cyclist from where it was taken by a team of children's health professionals at Great Ormond Street, which is a famous uh, children's hospital in London by bicycle, uh, in a ride for their lives uh, to Glasgow. And in fact, all the riders carried little pollution pods highlighting the changes in the air they breathed as they moved forward towards Glasgow. A key issue is that the science and evidence are clear and ambiguous now. Climate change is a public health emergency, the single biggest threat to global health, peace, and security, a crisis multiplier, 
and a significant driver of health inequalities with the poor and vulnerable and voiceless people who are the least responsible to co uh, contributing to climate change at greatest risk of suffering the consequences of actions mainly by the rich and powerful nations and peoples. The stance is also clear that these actions are also directly contributing to the unprecedented loss of biodiversity across the planet with max extinction of species and disruption of ecosystems, which are fundamental to very, our, our very life. Science and technology is also clear has, and demonstrated that there are practical technical interventions which can mitigate and support activities to tackle climate change and prevent further irreparable destruction of the planet. There are solutions out there. Science and technology has also resulted in contraction of the world into a single neighborhood and accelerated the dissolution of traditional boundaries that have long separated nations, highlighting our interconnectedness, interdependence, and the oneness of humanity and the tools to be able to implement these technical solutions. But it's also very, very clear that science and technology alone cannot solve the problem. The problem is not lack of science and technology, but service to the common good, volition, and fair, equitable application. For those who've been to Hiroshima, where, where the first atomic bomb was, was dropped, may recall an epitaph, which, which is now kept at the Peace Museum there, which says, we know 100 times more than we need to know. What we lack is the ability to experience and to be moved by what we know, what we understand, what we see and believe. Climate change, the pandemic and other public health emergencies have highlighted issues around our duties, responsibilities, obligations, and how they should be distributed, who should decide what we owe each other and how we should live our lives as members of humankind and with nature and other living things on our finite planet. The challenge therefore does not merely require technical fixes, but raises fundamental moral questions. These questions require revaluation of our norms and values. And as Albert Einstein highlighted, a substantially new way of thinking if mankind is to survive. The responses of nations to the pandemic, such as around vaccine equity, issues around climate change and other public health emergencies, such as racial inequity, have, have been referred to as moral failures and tests of character with consequences. These are words of actually of the director of WHO and other senior world leaders who have noted that we're on the brink of catastrophic moral failure. And the price of this failure will be paid with lives and livelihoods of the world's poorest countries. Issues around climate change, COVID, the pandemic, and these other emergencies did not merely fall, magically fall from the sky, but result from conscious choices of policies and practices driven by attitudes, norms, of leaders revealing underlying systemic structural issues. Scholars such as Smith and Upshur and others in reviewing the responses to COVID pandemic and the learnings from such pandemics in order to prepare for the future have highlighted, and I quote directly from this scholarship, Nothing will fundamentally change unless we truly understand, appreciate the nature and lessons we should learn from these pandemics and outbreaks. Our past failures, they've noted, must be understood as moral failures that offer moral lessons. Yes, we can learn how to better curb the spread of outbreaks and pandemics by using shiny new technologies, but unless we appreciate that we have a defect in our collective moral attitude as a global community, 
towards remediating the conditions that precipitate the emergence of outbreaks, we will never truly learn. These are not ministers of religion saying such things, but these are scientific and philosophers who've actually studied this during the past 20 years. The suggestion is, is that there's urgent need to commit ourselves to a set of values that engender approach to global public health emergency that embody a sense of solidarity and global justice. These are not just merely philosophical terms for armchair philosophical reflection. For example, the word solidarity by its very definition is a practice, it's something we do, whereby people express their support with others with whom they see themselves having something in common. With climate change, for example, there are commonalities of all of us recognizing the earth as one common homeland, irrespective of skin color, gender, religion, political values, and that we're sharing the earth with nature and all other living things. The other issues around climate justice has now become a core demand of activists and environmental justice is now a major area of research, political discourse and growing social movement. The 2030 Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement and other initiatives where, where the world has managed to achieve unity of thought in world undertakings have began to include aspiration as a new language around equity, inequality, leaving no one behind that has gone beyond the usual political narratives and the rhetorics. This has now provided us with opportunities for questioning of underlying assumptions which drive continued socioeconomic orthodoxies, which support and maintain the scandalous socioeconomic inequities, which continue to kill people on a grand scale, as highlighted by Michael Marmot and other scholars. This includes underlying assumptions that shape contemporary discourse, such as unfettered self-interest driving prosperity, that that progress depends on expressions of relentless competition, endless growth and relentless material consumerism. Climate change is indeed an emergency. And as Churchill noted at the start of the Second World War, the era of procrastination of half measures, of soothing and baffling expedience, of delays is coming to a close. In its place, we're entering a period of consequences. The consequences of climate change are serious and already apparent. And as highlighted by the scientists, will be catastrophic if we don't act. The question is whether we act only by after unimaginable damage, destruction precipitated by our stubborn clinging to narrow self-interest, individualistic and nationalistic perspectives and patterns of behavior, or we have the choice to consult, act together, is a choice we have before us now, and the COP meeting provides a perfect forum to achieve this. Whether we choose to that is fundamentally a moral question and how to exercise that depends on the norms and values which the society to, to decides to, to abide by at this time. As a meeting around health, I think it would be interested that the most recent World Congress of Public Health which was held uh, virtually, although it was held, to be held in Rome at the time, there was a statement on public health for the future of humanity, one planet, one people, one health, which was supported by public health organizations, associations, and associations of the world. And it noted that following World War II, there were emergence of significant international organizations such as U United Nations, UNICEF, World Health Organization itself and other great organizations. And it concluded that the science, the evidence and experience from the COVID global pandemic, climate change and other public health emergencies clearly highlight our interconnectedness and independence with nature and environments the oneness of humankind and the case for a one health approach to global health 
an urgent need for evaluation and strengthening of international organizations and systems to serve all people on our planet. In an editorial, it was, it's been noted that such transformations require considering the earth as one country and humankind as citizens, and a new social contract of ecological trustship, responsibility, and respect with the earth and nature. It sounded a little bit like a, surgeon, a sermon, I apologize, but, 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 but I just thought I sort of laid as a scientist that the arguments are not around the science and uh, the, the, the technology, but there are fundamental ethical and moral questions which we need to reflect on at this critical juncture in society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tazi. You are absolutely correct when you say that there is a, a very huge need to pivot the way that we think about our world. And even as Dr. Sami said in her presentation, our imaginations need to be more audacious. We need to push for these big dramatic changes in, in, in our system. And we can only do that when we put our focus towards justice and ethics and human uh, life and the interconnectedness of all of us at the forefront. Um, I'd like to pass over to Dr. Jill Turner, who will be talking about the importance of um, mental health and its effects on children and youth uh, in, under the guise of climate change. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for asking me to join this panel and to speak. Um, I work as a consultant community pediatrician in the north of England, in Northumberland. Um, and in the time I've got, what I'm going to do is just talk briefly about why climate change really matters to us as pediatricians. Um, and then also talk about what, um, possibly more importantly, what can we do to actually make a change? And what are the barriers to change, given that we've already heard that the it's not an absence of science that we're lacking. It's not an absence of evidence of the difficulties. It's really trying to understand what are the barriers to change and how can we overcome them? Um, just so you know a bit about me, so I work, um, I've got a particular interest in teenage and adolescent health, and I've also got a long-standing interest in young people's participation and the voice of young people, both within healthcare, but also within social change generally. So briefly, let's just outline how this all impacts on children and young people. So climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution really are the biggest public health threat that humankind has ever faced. Um, and this really is a child health crisis. Children are the most vulnerable to both climate change and to pollution. And this begins to impact before birth, throughout early childhood and right the way through adolescence. Um, it affects children's hearts, lungs, brains, neurodevelopment, mental health across the board. It, it's devastating the effects this is having. But importantly, and as our other speakers have said, this doesn't affect all children and young people equally that those in the global south and those already in poverty are worse affected and it's exacerbating the terrible health inequalities that we already know about. Um, there are a number of multiple and related cha uh, challenges. So heat, safe water, adequate nutritious food, extreme weather events, changing vector ecology and how that impacts on human health, um, environmentally forced migration and mental health. And I wanted to talk particularly about air pollution because of the impact that has on young lungs for a number of reasons. And the, the papers are all out there for you to read. They're nicely referenced in the Lancet Commission and also the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. The evidence is all there. But I wanted to mention that in April this year, there was a real landmark decision where a South London car at coroner listed air pollution as the cause of death for nine-year-old Ella Kissy Deborah. And that's a really important, important landmark change to recognise that. Um, by 2030, climate change will have reversed all recent public health gains. It will have put 100 million people back into poverty and it will be causing more than 150,000 deaths annually. So this is, is devastating. Um, briefly, I want to just talk about mental health. Um, this could be a, a long lecture in itself, but I'll just pick up a few highlights. So just thinking about extreme weather events, 
that the displacement and mass migration that causes and the disruption to families and to social networks and also the conflict of vi- conflict and violence that it causes because of resource issues that all those things have a devastating effect on children and young people's mental health. Um, it has effect on prenatal well-being, and I'm sure you're all aware of the vital importance of both the prenatal and the first three years of life for brain and neurodevelopmental issues. Um, we know that it causes post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, sleep, substance misuse issues, and there's evidence that following a disaster, you know, over 50% of children, and young people can be diagnosed with PTSD. So it's devastating given the massive numbers of children, and young people that are going to be exposed to these events. Then moving on to climate anxiety. So this is really a sense of fear and powerlessness, um, an acute sense of grief that children, and young people feel for, for the world and also for the future that they are now not going to have, the future they are heading towards. There's also a sense of disappointment and frustration and hopelessness. Um, Now, studies have shown that the top concern for children and young people in the UK is actually climate change. It's it's more important than all the other things they may be worried about, um, but climate change is the most concerning. There's been a study showing that 70% of 18 to 24 year olds in the UK can be said to be suffering from climate, climate anxiety. And there was a recent study in Australia putting it as high as 94%, whether that's related because of their extreme weather events that they've been suffering. So this is a big problem. So I've been involved in kind of children's rights and children's voice and young people's voice for some, for some years. Um, and in my opinion, things always go better when we both welcome and listen to and heed um, the voice of what children and young people tell us. Um, and that what we've got some wonderful global young activists who are speaking very clearly and comprehensively about what needs to happen. And for example, there's a quote from one of them saying that without a way to act, climate change and pollution is just too frightening. And I think actually children, young people actually say what's true for all of us as adults as well, that we need to acknowledge just how frightening this is in order to move forward. Um, And that if young people can channel their fear and their frustration into effective action, if they can really feel they can be part of a collective movement for change, then this definitely increases their resilience and their well-being. And in fact, that's true for us as adults too, that if we can actually really work collectively to move things forward, that makes a massive difference. Another quote from some brilliant young people. So we are a generation of scared people but we're also very persistent and very united, say the young people, yeah, with a shared sense of what must be changed. So young activists really understand that climate change is one of many interrelated crises that are caused by, as other speakers have said, putting profit before life itself. I just want to talk a little bit about healthcare um, because healthcare is very much part of the problem as well as potentially part of the solution. So you may have already heard these statistics, but if if the healthcare establishment um, was was thought of as a country, yeah, then we're actually the fifth largest producer of greenhouse gases. So healthcare globally produces 4.4% of global emissions, and that compares with less than 3% for the whole continent of Africa. So I've been working in recent years with both our Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, but also with the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, um, to think about how can we help health professionals become more effective, both at reducing our environmental impact as the health sector, but also help us be much more effective as individuals and as groups in achieving the change we need to see. Um, And what I really noticed is that within the health service, there is all the kind of inequalities and power structures that are present in society as a whole. And that can very much be part of the problem. Um, So for example, within healthcare, um, what essentially people involved in acute medicine, urgent individualized care. So responding and zooming in to save someone's life, um, but that is seen as more important than more holistic care, population-based care, preventative care, public health. Um, and that many doctors in the current system, oh, and within also the healthcare, um, the healthcare workforce, of course, doctors often have more power than nurses and other healthcare professionals, and that the oppression we see in society in terms of gender, social class, race, plays out within the power structure within medicine. Um, and that many doctors, sadly, 
really feel that the, the huge issues relating to health inequality and climate change are somehow too political. That's not my job. My job is just to treat my patient. And that, that itself is this, this lack of, of, of creative imagination about what needs to change. So, and also with health professionals, I've noticed that the, the very despair and powerlessness and sense of being overwhelmed that young people describe is exactly what I hear my colleagues talk about. When I challenge them to get involved, what they describe is those very strong emotions of being overwhelmed. So, um, as other speakers have said, we have all the evidence we need. We don't actually need any more brilliant scientific papers outlining the problem. Um, what we do need is major system change that really looks at our connections as a global um, one human family community. Um, and I feel like I'm absolutely echoing what the others, others have said. Um, so our current destructive, exploitative, oppressive, toxic system is really bad for all of us. And it's bad for all living things. And it's bad for our planet. Um, I was just reflecting on what I see as the primary barriers and what we need to do. Um, so I think that tolerating inequality and you know, non-cooperative, competitive behavior, tolerating that as normal is the problem that we absolutely must move towards cooperative functioning and seeing all of us as one global community. The other thing is a sense of separation and isolation. So separation from each other as humans, that we do care about each other and we have to be connected with that caring, um, but also that disconnection from other living systems and us being very much part of that ongoing living system that is the earth. And I think it's through that separation and anxiety, uh, sorry, separation and isolation that we enable that exploitative um, behavior to occur, explo exploiting other people, but also exploiting other living things. So in moving forward, um, I think we really need to be aware of and challenge all forms of exploitation and of human beings exploiting other humans, really being aware of forms of oppression, particularly racism, colonialism, the oppression of indigenous peoples, age-related oppression, so both the oppression of young people, but also older people, people with disabilities, gender-related, social class-related, that any of those forms of exploitation cause a disservice to all of us and stop us moving forward. So a good quote was, I think, is to change everything, we need everyone um, and we need connection and we need hope and we need action. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Turner. Uh, I actually don't know very much about healthcare, but that was such a great insight into how healthcare is actually one of our bigger contributors to climate change and also one of the systems that needs to be overhauled. It has such a long and sometimes questionable history, you know, modern medicine. And so reimagining that from a new lens and putting climate change at the forefront is, is really so, so important. Um, as all of our panelists have spoken, um, I would like to open up the floor. Uh, if any of our participants in the audience have any questions, please feel free to either pop your hand up to ask or you can put your question into the chat. Um, and while we're waiting for that, do any of our panelists have any additional comments that they would like to make? May I just thank my fellow panelists? That was, that was so insightful. And I was like busy taking notes and I'm like, wait, I have so many things to ask and talk about. Um, and, you know, one of the things, Dr. Turner, that you mentioned, that part of developing resilience is unified action, like collective spaces for action. And Dr. Tassib actually showed us an example of that collective space of action from healthcare workers. I mean, we see these, play, these um, efforts throughout the world, and I'm just uh, interested to know if you have more resources for this collective action. I know, for example, there's an organization called Healthcare Without Harm. There is an organization locally called Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, there's a Planetary Health Alliance. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of areas where people who work in health care um, and population health are coming together for collective action for climate. So I just wondered, uh, thanking, thank you first, and then wondered if you had other um, resources for our participants. Uh, 
I don't have any particular things that I can put in the chat straight away, but I think that there are a number of excellent um, organizations where people are coming together. And I think the challenge we have is how to translate what the synthesis of, of understanding and how to put power behind that, because I think there's still a danger that that's seen somehow as a soft conversation rather than actually the recipe for big change. And so I think acknowledging the power structure that we have and being able to confront it and keep confronting it, because if it would, if it was going to change easily, it would already have changed. And so we need to be thoughtful about how we appreciate the difficulty. And I suppose for, for me, it's about how do we apply strengths of purpose and persistence um, in, a, in a completely cooperative, nonviolent way, but that we are going to move in this direction and take everyone with us. And yeah, that's my thoughts. Uh, Dr. Tazib, you had your hand up. There are a huge number of organizations as, as part of the climate change agenda. If you look on the Global Health Alliance, there's a directory of all these um, mound feelings. We, we don't need any more organizations. We really need to understand. And, and they're, they're, so if you look on the Global Health Alliance website, there's a whole directory of them. You can pick your mix, uh, you know, as you wish. Um, I have a question here from the audience, from Carol Curtis. Uh, the question is, what as individuals who are not in the medical field can we do to assist in bringing about some of the needed changes in the health field as, if, as it relates to climate change? I'm eager to start, but I always talk too much. Shall I, <laughs> shall I kick off and then others can join in? So okay. I think there's... there's absolutely lots to do. So from the fairly small things whereby whenever you have contact with any part of the health service, I think to bring to their attention the fact that you are aware of the environmental impact and that you expect your health provider to be doing everything they can to be part of the solution. Um, and I think for every, every person when you access healthcare to be really thinking about being in charge of that. So challenging that power dynamic. So we need to be constantly questioning if somebody thinks they know what the right thing is to do, that it actually goes with your ethics and what you want for yourself, your family and the population, rather than this idea of it being an individual contractual relationship between a doctor and a patient. It's way more complex than that. So I think bringing that perspective to every contact you have and encouraging I think many doctors don't think that that's what other people are thinking, when in fact it's what lots of us are thinking. So it's bringing that to the table. Well, go ahead, Dr. Sami. Did you want to say something? No, no, I'm just nodding my head in agreement. I'm oh. so sorry. Please carry on. Oh. <laughs> um, I did have a question actually. Um, when we talk a lot about uh, institutions and systems that need to be completely rebuilt, you know, if we want to see the shift and we're talking about creative imaginations and changing our perspectives. And this is all very much at this very high level of institution, system, government, but not all of us are sitting at the table, so to speak. So, you know, while we're talking about the individual role uh, in changing the healthcare field, what what could be the responsibility of an individual um, in pushing for this change at, at this high level? Um, that touches a little bit on a on a thought that I had, so I might not directly answer, <laughs> but it's connected. I promise. You know, one of the greatest lessons that we've had as a public health community in the pandemic and COVID nineteen is we just, I think, made the gravest error that all we had to do was communicate the science. Um, but in fact, it was much bigger than that, right? Especially in the world today where, as Dr. Tassif also mentioned, this individual freedom and rights has become such a political fire. 
And in the same way that the concept of national sovereignty is preventing nations from participating even in the COP26. So these concepts of like, it's my freedom, the nationalism and this individualism have really impacted our ability for collective action, for taking care of one another. So one of the greatest lessons for us as a public health community has been how do we connect individual responsibility to conversations of freedom? How do we connect collective responsibility and security to the concept of national sovereignty? How do we bring accountability and that connection to light in this process? And communities actually that think in collectives, communities uh, even in neighborhoods that knew each other as neighbors, believe it or not in this day and age, we have to encourage each other to get to know our neighbors, right? Communities that had those connections experienced less uh, political discord, experienced less um, clashes, even locally speaking from a kind of a, a non-faith-based perspective or, or a non-political perspective, just in, in between the, the neighbors themselves. So really connecting with your neighborhood, with colleagues, with friends, that seemed to make a big difference in how people interacted, even with information about vaccines, believe it or not. And we know from um, uh, research on addiction that part of the root cause of addiction is disconnection. And when we disconnect from one another, we make it much more likely for addictive behaviors to emerge in individuals. And so much more so when we think collective. The last thing I'll say about that concept is that in the United States, uh, if you standardize population measures, our indigenous communities have higher rates of vaccination. And when uh, researchers go in to do a more um, qualitative assessment of why that is, the result comes back as we have to take care of each other in the same light as we think of our planet. So for me, it's always about this balance of responsibility and freedom, of collective well-being and accountability and thinking about our nation state system. Uh, Dr. Tazi. Um, there are several questions around what does all this stuff means in practice? And there are several good questions around what's it got to do with public health, in a sense, by asking a question, what are local public health departments? Just to get back to some basics, um, public health, you know, is defined as art and science of uh, promoting health, preventing disease through the organized efforts of society. So it is within the mandate of public health to actually have a debate and to contribute to organized efforts of society. The problem has been that often there have been people imagine them to just do, talk about obesity and tell you to eat less or to smoke less, tell you not to do. But public health is much more about what we should be doing and debating about organized efforts of society. So in a whole issue of the Journal of Public Health 18 months ago, we just debated about what we owe each other within an organized effort of society. This may sound very theoretical. Of, um, Mr. Arthur Dahl asked a question, what does all this mean in practice? The whole issue is that we need to be much more reflective about what we do in practice. Um, so, so, so my own feeling is there's a misunderstanding perhaps around what public health people should be debating because they've been pigeonholed and uh, what, what, what they should be doing. But in terms of what all this stuff means in practice is we should need to reflect much more about our norms and values, the assumptions we make around our, and our values. And this is our individual values, our community values and our institutional values. And unless you, you find the linkage between the individual the community and the institutions would serve them, the argument becomes very siloed. Hope that's not too philosophical. No, that's great. You know, I, the, the interrelatedness of everything. And I, I would like to add that so many times the, um, the definition of public health is lost. You know, when you say to somebody, what is public health? We say, oh, it's preventing disease. And so immediately we link it with, healthcare. Oh, it's the medication that you're taking. It's 
are you exercising enough? Are you eating the right things? But so often we forget that public health is also the way that we think. Where do we live? What does our built environment, you know, contribute to our to our well-being? What are our social interactions? What is our family life looking like? So the definition of public health, the real definition of public health is that it is what is it? It's everything. It's really the foundation. It's not just one, it's not siloed into just healthcare or, you know, policies about health. It's really education. It's about development. It's about health, et cetera. Um, let's see, do we have any other questions? From Gary Colliver in Mariposa, California. Can you speak to the role that local public health services departments have in promoting these wider, larger views about our connectedness to these issues and challenges? Um, maybe Dr. Sammy, you'd like to take this. It sounds like something right up your alley. Sure, I would love to, but also Dr. Turner, did you have something for the last point? Did you wanna share? I wanted just to talk about the pharmaceutical industry, but I'll do it after your, after your contribution. Okay. <laughs> um, so many people don't realize that the, the field of public health and urban planning emerged at the same time. They were the same thing, right? And it was only after the Second World War, really, that uh, public health became aligned with medicine and urban planning became aligned with engineering. In the beginning, public health was about population health. How do we address infrastructure for health equity to make sure people don't die because we're not separating water that's sewage water, sewer water, and potable water. Um, how do we make sure that our living and working conditions are safe? All of the things that we think of in society as the organized efforts, as uh, Dr. Tahzeeb so eloquently mentioned, those were public health and actually urban planning, which is one of the reasons that I decided to combine the degrees in my doctorate. I did an urban planning and public health um, kind of integrated interdisciplinary process. At the, at the chagrin of the departments that I was, they were like, what are you talking about? This has nothing to do with each other. I'm like, no, <laughs> it does. And there's actually a movement to reconnect urban planning and public health globally. The International Society for Urban Health provides spaces for planners and public health professionals to work together, for example. And uh, Dr. Turner mentioned this, it's about power. Right now, the white coats, Trump, the normal clothes of the public health task forces, right? And because of the ways that we've individualized health, and we tend to think of health as something that happens to individuals, my health, my doctor, my care, right? So we individualize that so much that it's directly related to consumerism. We think we can buy our way into good health, which also creates inequities of its own, has impacts in pharmaceuticals, but Dr. Turner will, will touch on that. Instead of making us individual consumers of healthcare, how do we shift our thinking and imagination into understanding that our health is tied together? I can't be at my highest level of health if you are not at your highest level of health. My community can't be at the highest level of health if all our communities are not. The pandemic has been the greatest lesson there. Right. So really, that's why I say it's really about these conceptualizations. Practically speaking, last thing I'll say is that especially in the United States, public health is suffering from this extreme identification with medicine. We have to learn to expand our thinking about population health and really put it in the realm of social justice. That's what we used to do. We got to bring that back. We're the ones that have to advocate for affordable equal housing, eradicating racism, making sure our water is accessible for all, you know? We have to be right there. And then we rely on our medical systems and our sisters and brothers in medicine to protect those few, hopefully in the future few, that we can't protect because of these big changes. And it's like, how do we do this together? Okay, sorry, I talked too much. I will hand it over. No, such important points. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Turner, did you want to talk about the pharmaceutical? I think that was answering one of the questions. Yeah, um, I'll try and again, we could speak for an hour about this, but I just wanted to bring to people's attention the, the massive effect that the pharmaceutical industry 
and people making money out of healthcare delivery has had. So research has been hugely influenced by what people can make money out of. And this idea of that you, 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 you go to a medical professional and they give you something or they do something to you and the surgeon can buy um, machines to, to operate on you. It's a whole commercial enterprise which has completely distorted the way we think about healthcare. And for example, if, if you could sell access to green spaces, yeah, if you could make that a drug, it would be probably the most potent drug that is available, but we don't even talk about it because nobody can sell it or not yet. <laughs> so it's, it has a massive, massive, massive effect. Um, and we need not to, not to um, minimize that. Um, and whenever, wherever you can see it, and it's a, it's a huge challenge globally because it, 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 it exacerbates inequalities, which really don't have to, yeah, it's a completely wrong way of looking at healthcare um, in brief. Can I make one more point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there is a, 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 a effort to think about health in all policies, not just health policy. To think about health in all research, not just research for health. Uh, sorry, not just health research, but research for health. And that means that all sectors, as Anisha, you mentioned earlier, everything is related to health, right? All sectors impact our health. And I, as I mentioned in the chat to, to Mr. Gary, um, what's really important for us as public health practitioners actually is learning to work with other sectors, not being scared to walk over to the housing department, to the transportation department, to um, industry, to working with uh, the private sector. Very few public health professionals actually work in the private sector to help corporations understand their impacts to, to, to population health. As Puria just mentioned, definitely the food industry. Um, there is an excellent book about how corporations, like five major corporations, contribute to uh, health outcomes. Um, they're, they're legal, but they're highly toxic to our environment, to our, you know, for example, food products. Uh, boxes that have food ingredients are products. They're not food. Food comes from nature. It has its own natural packaging. <laughs> so really rethinking the, our interactions and learning public health professionals, learning to work with other sectors to put health at the center, I think is really critical, which includes climate policy. Yeah. And, and just to, to ex not expand, but to bring it more to a global level, um, from my personal experience, I've noticed that everything that happens in the U.S. and um, more developed countries in terms of their policies, you know, food, medicine, etc., we're starting to see those being reflected because these countries are really, um, they're the ones who are funding aid and development in, in poor, poorer, underserved countries and so these same policies are now being implemented in other countries and so the cycle is going again and maybe my question there's a question in here somewhere which is and and I think Dr. Tazi did touch on this right at the beginning of his talk where you know those who are the most affected by climate change are those who are the least contrib you know least contributing to the overall effect so where does the moral ethical, you know, as some, if I was the one who was contributing less, I could say, but I'm not doing much. Like, why do I have to put all this effort in to change? You guys are making all the bad decisions and ruining it for the rest of us. You guys need to, um, you know, shift your thinking. Where does the responsibility, not necessarily responsibility, but like, is there a greater responsibility on you know, those who are contributing more and less of a responsibility on those of us who are contributing less? Maybe that's my question. Uh, that was a rather deep question, Anisha. Uh, it's, like, <laughs> it's like the question that the student asked the professor, that the professor is like, uh, let's take a break. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I think, um, Here's something interesting to think about. What is the individual responsibility? And you can think of individual as my individual or nation individual. And what is the collective responsibility? And I think that we're 
not very good with understanding how to distinguish with those um, responsibilities. Some of it needs to be accountability. So for example, what I put into my mouth is my individual responsibility. What I have access to is not my individual responsibility. That's a collective responsibility that is shared for, with private and public sector and civil society advocating for things, right? So really thinking about what is this, how do we, how do, we do this? And I think the important point is that in the collective, that's where you develop resilience. That's where you develop compassion, kindness. That's where imaginations can shift. Because if it's just myself in my isolation, I may not have a big vision. But it's only in those interactions that we can start to understand and pay attention to how we're impacting one another. So for me, it's also about really engaging in this conversation of what is individual and collective responsibility um, and accountability. And how do we ensure that there are spaces for the collective to reimagine. Like, um, for example, it's not my individual responsibility that the world doesn't have vaccine equity. Mm -hmm. it, is my, it is part of my duty as a human being to advocate for vaccine equity uh, in terms of the global space for that. But if I myself in the United States refuse to get a shot because they don't have a shot somewhere else, that doesn't help somewhere else. You know, I have to be able to be part of that collective advocacy. Individually, my responsibility is I need to make sure that I'm vaccinated to protect my community. So, you know, there's like, there's ways to think about it. And again, as Dr. Kazib earlier apologized, that might have been too philosophical, but I think those are important. I'm just wondering that this has been a good advert for public health and a good, uh, so, but, but I'm just wanting to get back to the major theme around, uh, we are on the first day of the COVID, uh, of the, not COVID, of the, of the, uh, of the COP uh, thing. And um, the international uh, IEF, International Environment Forum has had a panel on health equity. And I'm just wondering, and there are thousands of these meetings going on, what is our specific contribution uh, as part of IEF to this discussion and discourse? So that's why I'm racking my brain uh, because we're covering a lot of, you know, good this debate about what is, what is not public health, but that's, that is perhaps on the side because, um, the, you know, public health is only part of the debate and, and health is only a very small part of the debate. So I'm just wondering whether we either need a more detailed discussion, what does all this stuff mean in real practice? If we're talking of solidarity and social justice, what does actually justice mean in practice historically? Uh, where are we in our history? Because the UK um, presidency at the UN, their speech for this was that we actually need to grow up from adolescence to adulthood. What does it actually mean in practice? And what did Boris Johnson speech writers actually mean by this, uh, by this analogy? Because this is actually quite a profound, uh, I'm very familiar with the speech writers. That's what I'm actually trying to, to highlight because this wasn't just a theoretical construct. So I'm just wondering whether the, we, perhaps Jill, you, you, you'd like to sort of reflect on the meaning of this in practice on the first day of the COP26 and perhaps the contribution of IEF around this agenda. I don't know, being a troublemaker here, but I thought just get us back. <laughs> Troublemaking can be very useful. Um, I, I don't think I'm the right person to, to comment on the contribution of IEF and I'll maybe leave that to others. But I think the idea of, of well, <laughs> when people say moving from adole adolescence to adulthood, uh, my hackles begin to rise because I often think that adolescents or young people are actually more able to speak truth and speak passionately than many adults who get distracted into cynicism or what they see as being reasonable or, or pragmatic when in fact what they mean is cynical. So I actually, I'm not sure that moving from adolescence is a good idea. Um, but I think, I personally think the key ingredients are around connection and us talking about us being you know, one, one planet, one human family, and that this is about all of us and that no, nobody gets to be excluded. And somehow bringing that to every single discussion and that exploitation and ongoing inequality is going to kill us as humankind and that we have to bring that. 
and that I'm very suspicious at, at, at some of, well, at a lot of the rhetoric because I think it's still playing into the old paradigm of progress is somehow, yeah, that in order to get progress, you have to divide, you have to compete against each other, you have to increase inequalities. And I think we have to speak out very strongly against that. Um, and whether that's between different groups of human beings or between us and the natural world. And I think we just have to keep saying those things very strongly. And I think adding on to that, um, this idea of, of success and development is so closely linked with economic success and gain, financial gain, that, you know, we're willing to do pretty much anything. And we're not looking at um, equity and health as something that's not related to money. You know, we don't actually need money to be healthy. We need to have an environment that's conducive to all of us, where we can all live peacefully, where there is you know, where we don't have fear of war, we don't have fear of where our next meal is going to come from, or whether the next generation is going to know where their meal is coming from. This, um, this climate anxiety that you had mentioned, Jill, or um, I think the other term was climate grief, is something that I just recently read. And it talks about how the changes in our environment from our behavior, but also from the generations before us, how they're impacting us. There's so much anxiety. And we've noticed this, you know, just during the last 18 to 20 months that everybody is talking about mental health. We're all talking about, oh, get out, get out of your house, do some self-care. But we're forgetting to think about the world is changing around us. You know, when I was in primary school, we were talking about save the rhinos. And today we don't talk about save the rhinos because we killed the last rhino. So it's within my lifetime, these things are changing. And, and that sense of anxiety and that grief for what we're losing is really intense. It's, yeah, I don't have a question. Just that was my comment. There is a colleague um, from Uganda who's got a hand up for some time. Yes, Jay Ooh, yes please. Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, so here in Uganda, we're very keen on planting biodiversity to encourage better nutrition and so on. And it's, it's against the grain in a way because people think that to be a commercial farmer and have monocrops is the way to go because that's what they've done in the States. So we're trying to cap, um, encourage the indigenous wisdom of the elders and encourage biodiversity. I'm here with a colleague who's looking for ways to buy the seeds to be able to increases diversity and so on. And so that, that's a, a direct link to me is how we grow the food and how diverse it is, is to, you know, to the nutrition. So for growing avocados and jackfruits and so on as part of the gardens, then the babies are becoming less malnourished. And this, in this country, you know, most people are living on less than $2 a day. So they don't have money, you know, at all to buy extra seed. So if they lose the diversity of their seeds, then they lose everything because they don't have the seeds that they can share with each other. Um, so some of the things that have come in, like you know, hybrid seeds that you then have to buy the pesticides and so on, and you have to buy the seeds again because hybrid seeds don't reproduce properly. Those are things that have come in as being commercial and being the way to have progress, but actually destroying the, the biodiversity that was giving the resilience was giving much better climate you know, resilience as well. I'm not quite sure how to address that, but we are here in Uganda planting trees and the young people love planting trees here. And it's young people who have invented something called a tree mapper app. And so we can record where the trees are and monitor the growth and put that on the plant for the planet. The International Tree Foundation was started by the highs in 1922. We're still having 42 projects around the world. So I think trees is something that can help the kids feel like they're doing something and maybe alleviate some of their stresses that, you know, if I encourage tree planting, they can raise funds, car washes and stuff. Some kids in the Kansas raised funds for laptops here. So the kids here are learning um, to use the laptops to help, you know, the plant to the planet and so on. So I think sometimes maybe they just need information on what could be done to be of help because tree planting is a really, really, really good help. And when Gary Matai was one of the first people to get the women's green belt movement going and 
And it's connected with this connection too, because in groups, then people plant the trees, they make the nurseries, they understand that they're taking charge of their own development. So it encourages this collective spirit too. I probably have said too much, but <laughs> we're trying. No, thank you so much for sharing. I think it's important to share these stories, otherwise we would never hear about them. You know, I had no idea about that. Can I just greet our friends in Uganda, Oliotia, Nyabo, and Sebo there, Oliotia. <laughs> it's lovely that you're joining and greeting us and giving us such a wonderful connection um, oh, to the indigenous communities. Uh, <laughs> There is a panel on Thursday about biodiversity where you'll hear more about the trees story, yeah. I think, on Thursday. But I'm just wondering, using the analogy of the seed and the tree and planting trees, uh, on Thursday also the COP is going to talk about trees planting, which the media are saying are just an excuse not to doing the big things. I'm not a tree specialist, but the UK media are saying they're going to agree to plant 50 million trees it's not a bad thing, but they said it's a cop out of doing other more important things. I, I don't want to comment, but the tree debate is very, very interesting. But I'm just wondering what seeds can we plant which will grow into actually making a real change? Solar panels is a good thing. Having electric cars is a good thing. But the evidence uh, through the, all these scientific stuff, which I read for my day job, is not going to really turn things around. Um, and 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 I I I, I what oh, will actually turn? If you Dr. Taxi, something that you um, um was was bubbling up in me as well was what is the difference between performative action and real transformative action? And I think that this is something that's super important to think about. Uh, for example, even tree planting can be detrimental depending on the type of tree. For example, did you know that there are male and female trees? And then if you plant too many male trees, you can increase levels of allergens in a community. So people don't usually think that way when we think, oh, let's just get some trees and plant them. No, actually, you need to really think about biodiversity and indigenous community, uh, indigenous plants, I mean, native, uh, native plants to the, to the region. So even something as amazing as tree planting needs to have considerations that are much deeper. So this what are we doing? Are we doing this planting 20,000 or 20 million, whatever trees as a performance to remove the national and collective accountability for changing our uh, relationship with the planet? Or are we actually trying to ensure that we don't destroy the Amazon rainforest, that we don't destroy um, the lake in, in Lake Victoria in Uganda? What are we actually doing to be able to protect our communities. And oftentimes, these big flashy things actually can do more harm than a real change at the at the grassroots. Um, someone has their hand up, but I can't see who it is. Oh, Laurent, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. It's really nice to see uh, some of the friends. Um, yes, the I mean, uh, just a comment, not just about tree planting, but also what needs to be done. And um, plant, of course, planting tree is wonderful. It's very much needed. But we know when we plant a tree, it becomes really effective only after 30 years or 50. Actually, ideally, a tree will be extremely effective after 500 years. So that's the problem we have with planting trees is that uh, we won't get a quick result Especially we need to commit for 200 years to let them grow, which is also very hard, I think. Uh, but we should also stop cutting those that are very effective, like the large trees. We have primordial forests who are more than 500 years old. And when you cut a tree that is 1,000 years old, you are actually preventing uh, a lot of uh, carbon capturing. So this is one, th one thing about tree planting. It looks very nice. It's very like like Farhang was saying, it's really, um, it's uh, very attractive for the media, but it's not enough for sure. I mean, we can't solve it just by planting trees. And, uh, and since world leaders are uh, currently sitting in and uh, meeting together in Glasgow, what world leaders can do, which I think would be very effective, 
is to prevent uh, subsidies, stop giving subsidies to harm to all uh, um, activities that are harmful for the climate. And there are many of them, including, including uh, uh, land use, destruction of the space needed for biodiversity for um, what ecosystems can do very well for us. So this is, of course, that, that's not individual action, but uh, we can expect leaders to do more than what they do. And of course, leaders cannot do everything because uh, they need the community to support them. They need um, the private sector to support and so basically there's no simple recipe, but it needs to be done at every level. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I, I guess it, it really brings us back to um, the, to moral and ethical considerations for everything, you know? when we pivot our, our perspective and put the moral and ethical issue at the, at the forefront and we talk about equity, then we can start you know, saying, oh, this doesn't work for this person and it doesn't work for that community. This, this solution doesn't work for everybody. It's not the right solution. And so, yes, maybe planting trees looks good. And in some cases, planting trees can have short-term, you know, immediate benefits. But when we're talking about uh, a complete systemic change, it's like all of the panelists have been saying today, we really need a shift in perspective. This idea that we are one planet, we are one mankind, we are all interconnected despite being on different continents. We need to start thinking about how actions here will affect action uh, will affect livelihoods over there um i have just five minutes left do any of our panelists have final thoughts um before we we end the session i want to just highlight what uh, dr tassi mentioned earlier and that was that this is the age of consequences and that we have reached the limit of what our systems that we've created so far can create. And I really hope that COP26 doesn't become a performance and that it really leads to long lasting, deep structural change that will finally recognize that we are one human family on one home planet. Dr. Turner, Dr. Tazi. I, I would I would I would reiterate that that the, the health, well-being, peace, and security of the world cannot be attained until you know it, it unity is a change. It's interesting what's happened with COVID. Just just thirty seconds. What happened with COVID? Firstly, they tried to treat individual patients, but the latest thing that the World Health Assembly, which will come up in a few months' time, they're actually doing a global convention. Uh, on around COVID to look at emergencies, doing it globally. That for me is is is, is good, uh, and and lots of public health are very engaged in terms of ensuring the wealth assembly passes that. But until you get rid of uh, everyone's treated equally around the world, and mankind is is seen as one homeland, powerhouses such as the rich, powerful nations, the G20, perhaps is going to determine the agenda rather than it being recognized as members of one family, uh, it's going to be an interesting time ahead for our children and grandchildren. And I think I'd echo the one human family, but also being able to think on a much bigger time course that it, we need to get away from the individual immediate response and really be thinking about being able to conceptualize what has happened over the last 50 to 100 years but also thinking ahead seven generations and that we have to there is a climate emergency we have to act now but it needs to be a lot with the, with the concept of a much much longer time frame and help other people do the same okay well Thank you so much. I am going to close the session here. Um, I know there's a, quite a few more questions and comments coming through. Um, sorry, we won't be able to share them, but um, 
I hope this conversation continues in your living rooms around your dining tables. It is so important. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. It's been such a wonderful, informative, dynamic conversation. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tara, for presenting. Really wonderful. Thank you, and thank you to our wonderful facilitator, Anisha. We appreciate you. Thank you so much.